Hey folks, how's it going? It's RND Diesel here today, and we're going to be hopefully kicking off a new video series, of course, depending upon your feedback, that talks all about how the 7.3 Power Stroke works. Now, in this video series, we're going to go component by component through the 7.3 Power Stroke, and I'm talking about a depth here that is going to talk about, for example, sensors, to the extent that we're not only going to be talking about how a sensor works, but we're going to also talk about why we might need certain signals from sensors and how we can use that to control injection timing and injector duration. Okay, let's get started. Welcome to part one. Now this is going to be an introduction and or overview of the 7.3 power stroke so that we can lay the foundation for the rest of this video series. Now to begin with, let's talk a little bit about the history of the 7.3. Now you've got to bear in mind that the 7.3 power stroke was first introduced to the marketplace in 1994, some say in a half, because it was offered alongside with the 7.3 IDI. Now bear in mind, back in 1994, times were different. We still had phones that had a cord coming out of them and were connected to a wall. None of this fancy wireless communication that we have today. But aside from the point, times were different, and so was diesel engine technology. Now, if we restrict our study of diesel engines down to just a light-duty diesel marketplace, then we can see that up until the 1990s, all of your diesel engines were mechanically injected. That is, they relied on a mechanical injection pump driven by a gear connected to the engine for timing purposes that supplied the fuel pressure necessary for injection, of course. While these mechanical injection pumps were reliable, they were also very limited in terms of their capability. The issue with these pumps is that like the issues we still face today in terms of diesel performance, diesel engines were being pushed for higher and higher power levels, all the while emission standards were cracking down on allowable emissions. Now, typically an effective way to increase the power of a diesel, or any engine for that matter, is to simply add more fuel and air. But there is an issue with this mentality. If you add in too much fuel and not enough air to the engine, you risk serious engine damage, or at the very least, fuel is simply wasted as it makes its way out the tailpipe in the form of black soot. Now, of course, in an ideal world, or at least the world where we live in, where we care about not leaving a constant smoke screen behind our trucks, you only add enough fuel as there air, is air available to burn it. Now, unfortunately, it's not an easy task to determine the amount of air available inside an engine, as the amount of air available to the engine changes with air density. Now, colder and higher pressure air, of course, typically has a higher air density. So that means that depending on what the weather conditions are like, or what altitude the vehicle is at, that the amount of air available also changes. So if you're an engineer back in the 90s trying to squeeze out more power out of a diesel engine, you're stuck between essentially rock and hard place. And I think that's a place that a lot of modern engineers are in as well. But you have the task of essentially calibrating an injection pump to operate under all circumstances regardless of air density. Now if the air is higher density, of course you want to add more fuel to make more power. But if the air is low density, you add less fuel so that you can meet the emission standards. Now of course the trick is the pump cannot possibly accommodate for different air density, at least the mechanical style pumps. So however you set it now at the factory, the pump will have to run that way for its entire life. So, of course, like any prudent engineer, you compromise and do exactly what the EPA says, and you calibrate the injection pump to only put out as much fuel as can be consumed under worst-case conditions. That is, with air density being at its lowest point. But unfortunately, this leaves an engine that is underpowered, sluggish, but it is emissions legal, and it's good enough. In all this time, however, you realize how much you've left on the table. Of course, you run the calculations and realize that you can significantly increase the power output of the engine and meet EPA emission standards if only your injection pump could account for air density changes. But to make things more complicated, you got to bear in mind that modern diesels are turbocharged to make more power. And, of course, this trend started in the 90s, and, of course, the introduction of the 1989 Dodge Cummins turbo diesel, everybody else was following suit. Now, however, it's very difficult to predict just how much boost pressure a turbocharger will produce at any given time. Now, without being able to account for the varying end density, of course, you, you're leaving a lot on the table. Your mechanical injection pump simply cannot accommodate for those changes in air density, whether it's from temperature or pressure, or a combination thereof. 
Now, this is the world that the 7.3 power stroke was born into. And it was with this realization that International Navistar and Caterpillar engineers formed a joint venture to develop an injection system for production use that could accommodate for air density, amongst other things. Now, as a result, Huey Injection System was born. Now, Huey is short for Hydraulic Electronic Unit Injection, but we'll cover more of what that means later on in detail. Now, this was an ingenious solution to the problem. Now, to put things simply, Huey took advantage of vehicle-mounted computers to measure parameters such as air pressure so that you could indeed account for air density, amongst other sensors, of course. Now, this took much of the guesswork out of the injection pumping equation as it allowed you to instantaneously adjust your injection parameters based off how the instantaneous parameters for the engine were. Now, it might seem kind of obvious to add electronic control to a diesel fuel injection system, especially when you consider that at the time the Huey injection system was introduced, gasoline engines already utilized electronic fuel injection. So why then is it so revolutionary to use the same technology on a diesel engine? In fact, you may wonder why we couldn't use a gasoline fuel injection system on a diesel engine. Well, to truly understand why, we need to break down what a diesel fuel injection system needs to do. When you think about a fuel injector, whether it be a gasoline or a diesel fuel injector, all it really is is a valve that has electronic control. When you send electricity to the valve, it opens up and it lets fuel flow out of it. Whenever you don't send electricity through it, the valve stays closed and no liquid flows. However, the difference between a gasoline and a diesel fuel injector comes about when you consider the environment that they have to operate under. Now, gasoline injectors, for reference, only operate in range of about 30 to 50 PSI, somewhere around there. Now, on the other hand, a diesel fuel injector can operate under pressures as much as 21,000 PSI, as is the case for the 7.3 power stroke in an unmodified variant. To make matters worse, gasoline fuel injectors are also typically put in a much nicer place to live. Diesel fuel injectors are generally placed inside of the combustion chamber, or at least the nozzle for the injector is placed right in the midst of the combustion. Now, a gasoline injector, on the other hand, is placed in the intake manifold, where it's shielded from such extreme heat, and it really doesn't see much greater than ambient air temperature. With all of these factors combined, it's plain to see why you might need to have a sophisticated diesel injection system. In this next series of videos, we're going to examine the Huey injection system, specifically for the 7.3 power stroke. Of course, a lot of the principles applied here will also apply to some of your Caterpillar diesel engines and the famous International VT365 and DT466s. Well, folks, that does it for this video here today. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you would, please go ahead and leave a comment in the comment box below. Let me know what your thoughts are. Let me know if you liked the video, if you want me to continue following on the subject, or if you think that I should move on and do something else. Take care.